Today we're talking about estate planning, which is really just arranging for the management and disposition of your stuff, really at two different times, and one usually happens before the other, is when you're incapacitated or you pass away. And most people already knew this as they're thinking of estate planning. So I'm planning for after I die, what happens to my stuff? And who does it go to? And that's what I have a will for and all of that. But what we're talking about with estate planning goes over before you die. If there's a period of incapacity, we need management. Uh, we need somebody to care for you. Um, we need your money to work for you. Um, and then, of course, distribution after death. So I want to bring on Tom, and I want to see what Tom has to say about estate planning and the definition of it. Yeah, I mean, I think you make a good point that when we bring up estate planning or someone hears estate planning, immediately you go to what happens when I die, which is definitely an important piece of it. Um, but it, it misses another really important piece is that incapacity. And so that is also a very important part of the estate planning is making sure that you can take care of or you have things set up to take care of you if you couldn't make those decisions, as well as then after you eventually do pass, what happens to your things. And so I think those are important to look at. Um, I will bring up that we have show notes in the a video. It's at the link at the bottom of our screen or the video. Um, and it's also on our website. Um, today, it's just mostly the board. So some people will take it. Look, we're going to be they like to blow it up, look, make it bigger, take notes on it. But uh, you can find those in the, the link below. Um, but I do think the, the two that two definition is important to consider. And one of the things that we want to point out, too, is, you know, we talk about estate planning. A lot of times we're talking about couples. We're talking about people who are married, maybe second marriages. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but this is also very important for people who are single, is if you are not married, have never been married, the after death part might not be as important, but the incapacity is very important as you don't have a natural caregiver sort of built in. You don't have a spouse. You don't have children. You need to really think through who is going to be making those decisions on your behalf if you can't make them yourselves. Yeah. Okay. So this is the first beneficiary with a married couple is the surviving spouse. So if we're talking about after death, estate planning, and this is the first beneficiary that we need to plan for, and we do plan for. So when a couple comes in to us, we look at all their stuff, we look at all their money, we look at how they want to live, we get a sense of the taxes that they've been paying, how much they have in their IRA, how much their social security check is, how much the other spouse's social security check is. We look at all that stuff and we mix it all together and come up with a plan. But we're thinking, okay, what happens if she dies first? How's he going to be left? Then we're thinking about what happens if he dies first? How's she going to be left? What's going to happen? And so I'm going to ask you, Tom, what happens to the average couple when one spouse passes away, say like in their 70s, and the other one lives on into their 80s, late 80s, 90s? How does that play out? Yeah. And so there are like, I mean, there's lots of things that happen, but two of the really important ones when it comes to kind of estate planning is first from an income standpoint, is there's a reduction in income when the first spouse passes away. Um, it can be, depending on the situation, that could be a really high reduction of income. It could be not as high, but in every case, every married couple, when the first spouse passes away, the lower social security check stops. So if you're both have been working, you might have similar checks. That could be a pretty large reduction in income as it might be cut in half, for example. If one spouse was stayed at home most of the years, took care of the kids, and then the other spouse was working, the reduction might not be as great, but there will be a reduction in income when the first spouse passes away. So that's, that's thing one that happens in all situations. And then the second thing that happens in all situations is you go from filing taxes as a married filing jointly a tax filing status to a single tax filer, which effectively cuts your tax rates or brackets in half as you get into those higher brackets or doubly as quick, twice as fast. Um, and so you pay a lot more taxes uh, when the first spouse passes away. 
Um, in the year of death is the last year you can file a joint tax return. So they give you the remaining of that year to file a joint tax return. But the year following the year of death, you start filing at that single rate, paying higher taxes, which can be a real problem if you have these large IRAs, you have RMDs, required minimum distributions you have to take out. That could cause you to be in a much higher tax bracket. It could cause issues with Medicare premium on IRMA. We have a, other videos on that. Um, but there, there could be a lot more taxes owed if proper planning isn't done in advance to help help solve for that. I mean, we see this all the time where a person passes away early that we've just taken on as clients. And then, you know, we're even planning Roth conversions. They've got this plan all laid out. Social Security check. One of them goes away. And then the fact that they go to a single taxpayer is huge. I mean, the brackets cut in half. And so in the year of death, we've got to go to the survivor and we've got to say, this is your last year to file a joint tax return. And I'm really sad to bring up money to you, but the year that he died, is your last year where you're going to take advantage of those higher brackets. We might want to think about a Roth conversion this year, taking advantage of, you know, the, the, the brackets upwards. Um, then from there on, you're a single taxpayer and that has higher tax rates on minimum distributions. And some people will say, well, I'm not anywhere near all that stuff. Well, you might be if you have a sizable IRA and then you inherit it from your spouse, and then they all get combined and you've got a big fat minimum distribution up there in your 70s and 80s, you might be forced into these higher tax brackets as a single taxpayer. And that creates IRMA as well. That's another uh, present to, to people um, that they're, they're not real happy with. So enough said about that. That is the first beneficiary of an estate plan is the surviving spouse. And frankly, when we're sitting down with two healthy people at 65, you don't know which one of you that's gonna be. You can guess at it. Um, so now let's talk about incapacity. So with incapacity, there's things that we need to do that we need to have ready, and which are the POA documents. We need the HIPAA release. And most importantly, we need to know who's gonna pay the bill for long-term care. And, you know, when we get into discretionary long-term care, and that's bringing somebody in to take care of you, whether you're making the decision or not, um, having the money to do that. And um, so I want Tom to talk about a little bit about estate planning when it's just dealing with incapacity. Yeah. I mean, I think there's really kind of a, there's a lot of factors that play in, but if I had had to sort of break it into two parts, one is the legal documents of giving the person the ability to make those decisions from a legal standpoint, that's going to be your power of attorneys, your healthcare power of attorney, your durable power of attorney, or sometimes called a financial power of attorney, but it allows someone, it gives someone the legal ability to make those decisions on your behalf. And then the second aspect is, is the money. It's like, okay, now I have the ability to make the decisions. How am I going to pay for this care? And that can be just out of savings. It can be using long-term care insurance. I mean, there's lots of ways you can kind of get there, but you need to have that planned out of like, how are, if this happens, who's going to make the decision? And then secondly, how are they going to pay for that uh, care that I need? Um, the power of attorneys are extremely important. I mean, especially especially for people who are single, uh, they don't have a, a married spouse, is you need to think hard and long who that's going to be. I mean, normally when it's a, a couple, they're going to name each other as the power of attorneys. But if you don't have a, a spouse or you're divorced or something like that, you want to try to find someone who ideally would be a little bit younger than you. You don't want to be in the same situation like you get sick, but they're also sick. So you want to ideally find someone a little bit younger than you that you trust that can step in and, and help make those decisions. And then for a couple, you're going to name each other. And then what I would recommend is for those contingent power of attorneys or that second level is you pick, if, if, if you have multiple children, I would pick one of them as opposed to naming both of them jointly. Because sometimes, and you can do this as I could name, you know, my daughter and my son, both as uh, joint power of attorneys, but then they have to agree on the decision before anything can be done. 
and that can cause issues where if there's some disagreement between them, nothing happens. And so I would name one one person individually. You can name the next one as like the the follow up, you know, after them, second in line or third in line. But uh, I would that would be my recommendation. Well, and that creates problems for parents. So as I'm going to tell you, if you come to us, just blame it on us. Right. <laughs> Somebody needs to be the decision maker, and I would recommend. Absent of anything else, you use age, number one. If you have sons and daughters, I would be more inclined to pick the daughter over the son, just simply because we're talking about health care and older ages. And it might be, though, that the son is more business oriented, but you're going to have to make a choice. And then you just put the other one down second. And I, yeah. I would also use proximity as, a, as an option if one lives across the country and one lives locally. There could be some, there'd be a benefit to having the one locally be named it so they could be doing the things as opposed to someone who lives across the country. Sure. And every situation is different. But this whole period of adding the period of incapacity and planning for it is really what you're going to find different in this video because most of the time we're only talking about after death. And a lot of single people have used that. I'm not going to do a lot of planning, I'll let them work it out. You know, after I'm gone, I'll just, I got a will and, uh, you know, take care of after that. Well, that may be fine after you're gone, but that doesn't work too well in a period of incapacity where you're still around here to feel the pain of not having planned. So then we talk about after death, and this is pretty simple, other than the fact is most people think that we're talking about a will and probate here, and we are. So you're going to have a will. And you're going to go through the probate process. If you own property, well, unless you use a trust or unless it's joint property with rights of survivorship where you got names on there, you're going to have to go through probate. But we like to avoid probate with as much of the assets as possible. And that's where we use a lot of beneficiary decisions, designations. And most stuff that you have invested, most well, all IRAs and 401ks, they all have a beneficiary and then they have contingent beneficiaries and they can have joint beneficiaries, share and share alike. I mean, you have all kinds of options with these and beneficiary designations trump the will. So if there's a discrepancy, the beneficiary is going to be long settled before your will gets into probate. So the assets can already been transferred. So this is actually with a financial asset more important than this, or it takes precedence over it. And these are things that we can help you plan and change without even going to a lawyer. I mean, we, we, we can just set things up that they'll transfer directly to who you want them to transfer to. I would also make the point that, you know, a lot of times we'll say, okay, you know, have you, do you have a will? And they say, oh, yeah, I have the will. I've, I've written that already. Um, you know, it's going to my, my, son or daughter, wh whoever it is. And then we say, well, what about your 401k? Do you, have you checked the beneficiary designation? Oh, well, I have the will. I, I don't need to worry about that. And we have run across several cases where like a divorce spouse is named as the beneficiary. Someone who they definitely don't want receiving the money is named on that account because they never changed it. And that takes precedent to the will. I mean, the beneficiary is going to pass long before the will is settled in probate. And so you need to check those things. It's important. And again, to Hans's point, we as much as we can, we'd rather have things pass outside the will. It's just a, a time. It's you know, it can be costly. It can take a lot of time. You have to go down to the courts. You got to open up an estate. You got to go through an account for everything and show it's going to the proper people. It's just a, it's a lengthy process. Whereas a beneficiary on bank accounts, on IRAs, on four hundred one k's, insurance policies. I mean, you send them a death certificate. And they send you the money. I mean, it's just as simple as that. So it's it's an easier way to pass the money by. Plus, it's private. Plus, it's private, right? There's no. I mean, it's private. It's just not, the whole world's not looking at it, right? With this, this is public. That's a good. So point. let's talk a little bit about second marriages. Yeah, and you know, we run into a lot of people, a lot of our clients. In fact, this is half of them at least that come into us are in a second marriage, and when we get to estate planning. You know, this gets a little tricky. If they both have kids from another marriage, we got stepchildren involved. Okay. And we, a lot of times, 
people have made commitments to their kids back when they got remarried and they have a stepfather is she's made commitments to her kids to leave certain things to them. He's done the same thing regarding their stepmother. And this marriage may have happened 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago by the time they're coming into us, the second marriage. And so we're sitting here looking at the whole thing and we're saying, I see a problem. Starting with that a lot of people that come to us, they don't have enough money to be paying off kids at the first death. They just don't. So they need to leave most everything to each other when the first one passes because they, they just need the money. We talked about that earlier. The surviving spouse is going to need to be the beneficiary of the IRA and they're going to be minus the social security check or the smaller social security check. So they just need it. And you can just look right at people and say, you don't have enough money to do that. And that creates a little bit of a problem. Then you got the situation of unequal amounts of money that they brought into the marriage or that they produced in the marriage. You got all kinds of problems in this, and it's a generational thing. So one thing I will tell you, well, first of all, before I get into that, the solution, I want Tom to talk for a second. Tell yeah. What he's got to say about it. Yeah. I mean, I, this is oftentimes some of the more complicated things and, and hard to, conversations we have to have with clients is, you know, they came in, you know, and initially when they got married, the children are worried, like, is, is this new person going to take my mom or dad's all their stuff and I'm not going to get anything. So they're promising the children, no, that I'll set my stuff aside for you. But that might've been 15, 20 years ago. And to Hans's point, they come in and they don't have enough to do that. They have to leave it to each other. And they love each other. I mean, they're, they're still married. And so sort of by definition, hopefully they still love each other and want to take care of that, that uh, spouse who would be the surviving spouse in that situation. And so they have sort of come to grips. They're like, no, I need to leave this to my husband. I need to leave this to my wife. But that's never communicated to the children. So the children are still under the assumption that I'm going to get what I'm going to get when mom dies or when dad dies. And then it doesn't happen. Now that causes a lot of issues just from a relationship standpoint with the step parent of like, Hey, you took all my mom's stuff. When in reality, that was a decision they made jointly to take care of the other one, but that was never communicated with the children. And that can cause a lot of problems. So if you're in that situation, it, it, it's not going to be a fun conversation to have, but you need to have those conversations with your loved ones just to set the expectations. So they're not expecting something, something else happens. And then they start pointing fingers and blaming people and, and throwing accusations around and, That's just, it gets messy very quickly. Oh, it does. And, you know, life insurance can be the great equalizer. And we don't even a lot of times talking about a large amount of life insurance. So we can take the life insurance and put it in place and leave that to the spouse. We've got to buy a policy on both people. You know, a lot of times it doesn't have to be a huge amount. And we can still give whatever you want to give to the kids of your IRA or your assets or that kind of thing as long as we replace it for your spouse with life insurance, or we can go on about our financial planning and leave your IRA and other things, house, that kind of stuff to the surviving spouse, and then take the life insurance and leave that to the kids. And that's where a lot of times we end up even doing a smaller policy where we put a $50,000 policy on you and leave 25 each or a $20,000 policy and leave 10 each where there's just a known thing. So life insurance can be wonderful to put in place now. People are in their 60s or even 70s or 50s to take care of the children and stepchildren. And when we get all done, a lot of these people leave all four kids, like if they had two each, their children and their stepchildren, when we write these life insurance policies that are going to go to them, they leave it to all the kids so that everybody gets an equal check when either one of them dies first. And so we got some simple solutions for this stuff and it's easier. And just keep in mind that if this incapacity thing happens, the kids are going to get involved and that's a horrible time for them to be learning about all this stuff. So we encourage our clients 
to get the kids involved. We don't require it because some people just say, I ain't going over this stuff with my kids. I want to do all this stuff in private. And they could have reasons for that. But as a general rule, it's good for us to bring in the kids, at least with a phone conversation or something, and just for us to go over generally what their parents have set up. Yeah. And, no. I, and I think just I'll make one last point. And, and Hans, you, you do this a lot when we're meeting with clients is there's a large difference between the kids getting nothing at the death of the first spouse and getting a check for, say, ten thousand dollars. I mean, even though it's a small amount of money, it's, it, it just shows that I was thinking about the kids. I wanted to leave something and it, it kind of lowers the temperature on any potential conflicts by just leaving them something. Well, it does. Or everything went to my stepmother. Right. I mean, I just or everything went to my stepfather, um, the life insurance. Yeah, that's very good, Tom. Thanks for adding that. And, you know, the, the last point we have up here is we're doing everything we do from a planning standpoint. I shouldn't say everything, but most of what's driving all of this is our experience with meeting people on the way in. And our taxes that your children and grandchildren are going to have to pay on their inheritance from you, does that matter to you? Okay. We need to know that because we can plan for that. We can backwards reverse engineering in your planning so that the tax effect for them will be smaller. And we have clients that go both ways on this. We just, you know, some people tell us, look, the taxes, if my kids inherit a million dollars, Frankly, their tax problem is not my concern right now at this point. So that's good information for us to know because we're not going to plan for that. We're going to plan for your tax problem now and into the future, but we're not going to worry about other people. Once we show them the taxes their kids are going to have to pay on a big IRA, they want to do something about it. So, you know, when we're getting into estate planning, taxes and income taxes and even estate taxes are an issue. And we ask this question of people all the time. So what we want to do is we want to go through with these boxes on the board and talk about all the topics that we've talked about. We've, we've covered Social Security. These are the seven worries. We talked about Irma Medicare. We talked about long-term care. We talked about IRAs and 401ks as they work for estate planning. We talked about income and the reduction at the estate of the first spouse check going away. Uh, this obviously the whole video is about estate planning and taxes. So we've covered all seven worries a little bit in every single one of these. And that's really the way a lot of our videos work is we're not just talking about estate planning. It affects all seven things we talk about. And with that, I'm Hans Scheil. And I'm Tom Griffith. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.